Good morning. On behalf of the Dejamar, Dejamar family, I want to welcome you to Tinica's memorial service this morning. What a time that we can celebrate her life and be together as family and friends. Will you please join me as we play the piano? Oh, no, I'm kidding. Um, please join me in prayer. Our gracious God, we give you praise for Tinica's life. And we pray this morning that we would honor her memory, that we would rejoice in the person that she was, and we pray your blessing upon every aspect of our memorial service today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm Jack Dejamar, um, Tinica's oldest son, and we'll be reviewing her life. I did a chronological presentation of all the things that she encountered during her life and some of her amazing traits. She was 99 years old. She just passed away May 6 at the Fillmore Country Club, which is an assistant living place. And um, she was a very dynamic person. She didn't like being there, but at the point, there was nothing she could do anymore. So, but anyway, some of the traits, uh, Karen put some of these together for me. And, you know, she was always about family. She was very adventurous. She did a lot of traveling, even though after my pa and dad passed away. Strong personality, also stubborn. I think the caregivers are fully aware of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Fun-loving, determination, animal lover. She, I think she went to Ojai two or three times and rescued animals there. And every time a cat showed up in the back door, she, that was her cat from then on. It was uh, definitely an animal lover. And, um, and a lot of the traits I will get through on the, on the presentation. So next slide, please. <clears throat> This is, uh, this is Tinica, and uh, she was born January 13, 1924. To, uh, her dad name was Cornelius, and her mom was Trincha, and uh, that's her grandma in the back. Next. And that's Tinica, around 68 years old. She always, many of the pictures, she had bows in it, and she always wore um, the curls on the side there, that were, that's one of the ways I was able to, um, in the pigtails, I was able to recognize her pictures because so many pictures when I started going through them, I thought, who the heck is this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. <clears throat> this is another family uh, portrait. The lady on the left is her grandmother and the lady after that one is her mom, Trincha, and then Shannon and her dad. Shannon Tinica. Tinica. What? <laughs> it's a dyslexic problem I have between Shannon and Tinica. You probably see me do it more, but anyway. Okay, next slide, please. And that's her. Uh, that's um, Tinica with her mom, and that's her stepmom. Her mom died of breast cancer when she was 13 years old. Then her grandmother took care of her for a number of years until her dad remarried to uh, Betsy. And we actually met her in Holland uh, in, in, I think it was 1979 when we went to Holland. Next. That's uh, with her grandma. She was very close to her grandmother. When I, a couple of times when we went to Holland when we were kids, we used to visit all the time with her uh, because she took care of her for quite a while. Next. That's uh, Tinica with the pigtails <laughs> when she was a teenager. Next. And this is an interesting photograph. I mean, uh, at her, you can see where, the, where I circled her face. And the reason I know that was her was because of the pigtails. <laughs> but uh, that was kind of an interesting uh, in the picture with, uh, with the airplane there. Next. That's my mom when she uh, just, I think this was probably uh, just before World War II. And, um, Looks like a kind of a dynamic lady ready to charge, right? <laughs> Next. 
And then World War II started. And that was very bad times because the Germans basically dominated and took all of the food supplies and everything to, you know, to do their war effort. And they were rounding up all the young men to work in concentration camps. My dad was constantly running from them. And um, my mom helped him hide sometimes in the, in the fake floors and stuff when the soldiers came by looking for young men. And um, they had all night parties. They couldn't, there was curfew, so they couldn't leave. So they says, well, we might as well party all night since we can't do anything else, right? <laughs> and my dad was also, he wasn't old enough to be in the Dutch on the ground, but he assisted as the Dutch on the ground. <clears throat> I mean, there's one interesting story where him and a guy were carrying a carpet full of rifles between two places, and the German soldiers stopped them. But luckily, they didn't search them because if they had found those weapons, they probably would have assassinated them. That was a close one. Next. <clears throat> this is their tennis group. Even though there was a war going on, um, they had a tennis group. The one on the right is my mom and then my dad. And all the way on the left is uh, my dad's youngest sister, Tante Shana. Uh, in her later life, she lives in Australia, and um, that's how my mom met my dad, is through her. And there's an interesting story with this, because one time when four of them had finished playing tennis, and they were on the way back home, walking along the sidewalk, they heard a bunch of commotion up, and they looked up, and there was two fighters, a German fighter and an English fighter, going at it, doing dogfight. And one of them forgot to turn their guns off when he was diving down, trying to get the advantage, and he ripped up the street right next to him. Another close call. <clears throat> Next. I like this slide because it shows this is during the wartime, and you can see that they're just having a, they're trying to keep this, the situation, uh, you know, nice and not be all too bummed out about it, and they were having a good time. And the one thing I noticed, they're wearing Dutch shoes. Yeah. <laughs> so in those days, they still wore Dutch, you know, the, the wooden shoes. I thought that was kind of interesting. Wow. Next. <clears throat> Okay, then my dad and my mom married right after the war. My dad was born in Indonesia, and he liked a warmer climate than, uh, than in the war, because during the war, Sukarno, who was in charge of Indonesia, kicked the Dutch out. So after the war, he says, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to marry my mom, and then I'm going to go to Suriname, and I'll show you that in a minute. Next slide, please. This is, uh, it was a very formal wedding, in tux, tails, and uh, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the Dutch thing there. Next. And here's a horse and carriage. They actually went into the horse and carriage. <laughs> and next, and this is a happy couple. I was born a year later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> next. Okay, then, like I said, he wanted a warmer climate. And, and at the time, Suriname was a Dutch colony. And so in 46, um, my dad moved there, took the family over there, my mom at the time, and I was, I was born in 47, so about a year later. Um, it was a completely different scenario for my mom because that's a third world country, there was no paved roads, it was very primitive, but she was up for it and, uh, and, and thrived there. And all three of us kids were born there. Uh, my brother, Stuart, and Karen. Next. So if you see an in inset there on South America and uh, on the top above Brazil is where Suriname is, uh, nestled between British Guiana and French Guiana. French Guiana is where the Papillon Island, the famous movie Papillon was made, and British Guiana is famous for the Jonestown Massacre. <laughs> so we were right in between, and those are the places we lived. We started off in Groningen, that's where I was born. Then later on we moved to New Amsterdam, which was across the river from what, where the capital Paramaribo is. And then we moved to, um, to Quata, and that was after the second uh, time we had vacation in Holland. And then the final place we lived was New Nikiri. Next. This was our first house uh, where I was born. Um, it was a nice house. I remember some stuff about it. My dad had made this special little swimming pool in the back for us, and I still remember swimming in that. Next. That's me, just born. Look how cute, right? <laughs> Next. <laughs> That's my dad and me in, uh, in the local swimming pool. It was nothing more really than a concrete hole in the ground. It wasn't much, but we had a lot of fun there. Next. And that shirt's born. And that's my mom uh, with holding shirt as a baby. And I'm on the left. 
Next. Okay, then we go on our first vacation to Holland. The way it worked is that my dad worked for the Dutch government at the time, basically teaching modern methods of farming and, and all that kind of thing over there. And he worked for four years and he got like nine weeks off to go to Holland because it was a big deal in those days. Airplanes were not there and we basically were in a boat for 17 days because we stopped in Trinidad and we stopped on an island in, by Africa and uh, before we finally ended up in Amsterdam. Next. Uh, this is the only picture I really had of that time when we were about six, three, and two years old um, in Holland. Next. After that, we moved back to uh, Suriname and lived in Quada. That's the other house we had in Quada. This was a, a experimental ranch that my dad was in charge of, and they, one of the major crops there that they were perfecting was called pomplemousse, which is, you may have heard of them as high Hawaiian pomaleos. They're like big red grapefruits. And um, so that's why, that's why we were there. Next. And Karen has been added to the family, and we're teaching Sheward how to ride a bike in this picture. <laughs> next. And that's a picture of my dad in his office. Uh, the, right next to that house I showed you, he had an office. And they actually built a big thing where they could project movies to teach the people stuff. And that's me in the middle and my mom on the left. Next. Okay, now we go for our second trip to Holland in, in about 1956. Uh, again, we travel by boat, and uh, my dad and my mom go on a separate vacation to Germany and France while we stayed with our grandparents and my aunt, who was taking care of us at the time. Next. So there's a picture of mom and dad in, uh, this is a weird lake in France called Ger Germar Murmur or something. I don't even know how to pronounce it, but anyway, just a picture of them. Next. And this is the picture of us in Holland, and we're probably getting ready to go to school. And there's some interesting stories along with that because um, we had, since we were there for nine months, we had to go to school. We could not go, go to school that long. So my aunt was in charge of bringing us to school when the school opened. And when we got there, the nurse wanted to know our medical history. So she pulled us aside and she started asking me all sorts of questions. I was the oldest one. I was nine years old at the time, and um, she asked me, have you had mumps? Yeah, we had mumps. Have we had measles? Yeah, we've had measles. And that went on for a while, and at the end she says, have you guys had breastfeeding? And I told her, no, we've not had that disease. <laughs> <coughs> no. <laughs> so after the nurse and my, and my aunt picked themselves off the floor, the, <laughs> they really had a kick out of that one. And another one was, uh, in those days, they had desks with ink wells, and you actually had a pen where you had a dip to dip to write with. And uh, my, my brother, who was only six years old at the time, kept looking at that, what that was about. And probably about the third day, blew into it, got ink all over his face. <laughs> and my aunt had a heck of a time getting that ink all off of his face. That's <laughs> yeah, that's right. Inquisitive, right? <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> And that's a picture of uh, when we were in Holland, our mom going on a boat there. <clears throat> Next. Okay, every turn from Suriname on their second vacation, we moved to New Nikiri, which was the last place where we lived. And most of my memories are from there, because that's when I was about uh, 10 to 12 when I lived there. And uh, we were there about three years, and the bikini swimming pool was sort of the favorite gathering place uh, where everybody went. Uh, my dad taught us how to swim there, and um, they had like a special place where they would party at night and it was a real nice place and at the same time my dad um, lived in the jungle for about a month uh, serving a new canal to get to what they call the biggie pond and I'll talk a little bit about, about that and to this day that is still called the Jamar Canal because of the work he did living in the jungle I mean living in that jungle with all the mosquitoes and everything that wasn't much fun next Okay, so here is the upper left corner of Suriname, and right, right next to the um, Nikiri River there is where we lived. It was on a stilt, big house right there with a boathouse, and the Biggie Pond, that green area there, that is a huge water reservoir kind of place. It's kind of like the Everglades in Florida, and that's where the fishermen like to go there and fish. But where you see the blue line, that is the canal that my dad surveyed that's now called the Dejamar Canal, but in the past, there was, it was a creek that they had to follow. It took four hours worth of paddling to get all the way to that. 
And, and before my dad even surveyed the canal, our whole family went on a trip with the fishermen up there. It's dug out canoes, going up the, the, it took four hours to all the way get up there. And the story that I've told the grandkids many times is that there was this cougar following us along the side. We didn't see him, but we could hear him growling. And uh, he followed us for about 10, 15 minutes, and then he peeled off, I guess, because we didn't see him anymore. And next, this is a, uh, a, a current picture of what the Dijemeyer Canal looks like. And it's very similar to what I remember, except it's a little more overgrown now. And now they have fancy boats with outboards. At the time we were there, they had just dug out canoes, which is basically just a tree cut in half as the bark peeled off and then trimmed inside to make a canoe out of it. Next. And these are the fishermen. And what they would do, the, it wasn't that deep. It was about waist deep there. And they would put this big net in a circular fashion, and then they would walk away from it and hit it with sticks to drive the fish towards the net. And that's how they fished. Next. Now, uh, this is the hut we stayed in that time, first time we went. Ours was a little bigger than that because we, and basically you just have hammocks that go from post to post. And looking at it now, I'm going, you know, for kids it was no problem, but, you know, sanitary conditions for my mom going to the bathroom and something like that, how to, but, you know, she never complained. <laughs> but I'm sure that was challenging. <clears throat> Next. Okay, and then uh, after you get out of the Dozermark Canal, then you, then you end up on this big, biggie pond and you can see the vastness of it. And this is a, from a present day picture I found. Next. Now this is what it is now like. They've got formal housing on there and it's very popular because it's a bird sanctuary. And um, go ahead, go next. And that's the individual huts that you stay in now. As you see, it's been modernized quite a bit. The roofs are designed to where the water comes off of it and goes in tanks, so it's the, it rains there a lot, so the water is always there, fresh water for each cabin. Next. And you can see here the whole thing of flamingos, and then the inset shows you the birds flying, and that is it's world renowned for that. That's why people go there, because of the, uh, the bird watching. Next. Okay, upper left, that is uh, Sheward and Karen in, uh, in our boat, in our boathouse, in front of our house in the Nikiri River. And one thing about it, we're close to the equator, so the differential in tides was 30 feet. So in the low tide, especially for new moon and full moon, when the new moon or full moon was there, the water would be in the low tide, was way in front of the, the boathouse, and at high tide, you had to make sure the boat was centered because it would go all the way almost to the roof of the boathouse. It was, it was just pretty amazing. On the bottom one, they see me and, and Karen uh, doing a boat ride um, in the boat. And uh, later on, I got an actual dugout canoe. That was sort of my favorite thing. I, I did a lot of canoeing on that thing. That's probably one of the reasons why I canoed on the Santa Clara River <coughs> <laughs> during rainstorms. <laughs> and you see the logs laying there, and those are, there was a sawmill right next to our house, and the, they would float these huge rafts of, of, of wood and then moor them onto the side on the mud banks and then pull them out one as they needed to mill them. Next, this is the uh, bikini, the swimming pool that was there. And uh, like I said, it was a very popular spot. We spent a lot of time there. Next, this is uh, a going away party for my dad at his office uh, in New um, as we we're getting ready to immigrate to the United States of America. And you can see I got a circle where my mom is in the middle is my dad and I'm right next to him. Next. Okay, so we arrived in Los Angeles in uh, December 1959. Um, we were on a, we went, he went, to immigrate, we had to go on a waiting list for two years. And uh, after that, we got permission to go. My dad went in October, flew to Florida because he wanted a warmer climate, so he stayed in southern United States and took the Greyhound all the way to here and finally found a field hand job on the ranch of Sespe, which is a ranch between Fillmore and Santa Paula, which doesn't exist anymore, it's been subdivided, but so that's where, <clears throat> that's where he was at. And then we came uh, in, in December uh, to meet up with him after he got an apartment uh, on Rancho Sespe and he was settled in. Next. That's us in Mexico City waiting for a connecting flight to LAX. <laughs> that bear that Shannon is holding, I found it in a trunk of my mom in the garage. <laughs> that's what's, Karen. Oh, <laughs> Keep correcting me, I'll get it yet. 
Anyway, that, that, it, it's not in the greatest shape, but it's, uh, it's old. <laughs> Next. <clears throat> this is a, 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 a picture when we were living in the rest of Sesame apartment. Um, it was, <laughs> I still remember that. This is probably 1960. <clears throat> Next. The first few years were tough, you know, my parents had to settle in, they weren't making a lot of money, and um, we had a, still a family to support, so I went to school in Fillmore from 60 to 63, some of the guys here probably still remember me from those days, and we moved in Sao Paulo in 1963, at that time I was, a, I had just become a sophomore, and my mom was, took some extra classes, so she'd become an assistant teacher, and after five years she became a citizen of the United States. Next. This is the Daughters of the American Revolution congratulating my mom on becoming a naturalized citizen. Um, after they, we got here, we had to register at the post office for five years, got our green card, then we had to pass a, a small civics test and an English test to become citizens of the United States. I had to do it separately, but my brother and sister were young enough so they became citizens when my mom became citizen. And, uh, and then my dad did it also. And that was in 1965. Okay, next. This is a, uh, a church membership that I found in all of her papers. You wouldn't believe all the boxes of paperwork we had to go through in her house. And uh, this means she was a formal member of this church. And Karen said that she even was a deacon here. Um, I don't remember that, but that, that was interesting. And um, we were married in this church, and my dad had a memorial in this church. <clears throat> Next. My mom taught at a number of schools. Um, she taught at the Santa Paula Christian Day School. That was a picture of her class and her in 64. And then uh, Grace Hill from 75, 76, she was there. But there was about 20 of these cards for all the different schools. She taught in Camarillo in the Christian Day School, different elementary schools in Santa Paula. So she had a long career as an assistant teacher. Next. This is a picture I found where her and the, and the kindergarten class is outside in the playground. In 1965 also. Okay, next. My dad died in 1981 when he was 59. Uh, he had diabetes complications, and in those days, they just didn't have a lot of treatment for that. So my mom kept right on going. Um, she basically joined the tennis team, and you can see him there. Um, Julie Van Dyke on the right, that's the only one I recognize. My mom's in the middle. And um, she played tennis till she was in her early 80s, and that's what wiped out her knees. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. She had lots of trophies and stuff that, that are still at the house. And um, she also was a member of two different bridge clubs, and she substituted the different bridge clubs. And she also uh, continued to make friends throughout her life. And many of them went traveling with her. Next. Now, she was a real adventurer, and uh, my dad had a sailing boat early in life, and she would always join him on that. And uh, she went to Holland at least four times that I know of. And she went to Italia, Italy, Australia, South Africa, Canada, Eastern US, and she also stayed at my brother's cabin. I have a picture of that. <laughs> Next. Here she is on the sailboat. It wasn't a big sailboat. My, my dad imported it from Holland. He was hoping to sell them, but he, they never became a market for them. People wanted bigger boats that they could actually sleep in. This was more of a day cruiser, and you could actually go to the islands with it if you wanted. Next. And here's a picture of her in Holland and uh, in Italy, the, of Venice. Next. And there she is in Australia, visiting my aunt, my aunt Tante Shannon, which was my brother's younger sister. Next. This is my brother's original cabin, and this thing was a real treat. I mean, it had like this huge fireplace and a pot belly stove where you could cook, outhouse in the back, <laughs> you had to go to outhouse. And my mom would used to go there with some of her friends, and the, and the Wawona Hotel had a tennis court, and they would go play tennis there. And they also swam in the rivers, and um, they had, I had, there was tons of pictures of her and, and the ladies there having just a grand old time. But it was very primitive, but she didn't care. It didn't bother her. <laughs> Next. She was also a humanitarian, a very social person. She donated to uh, uh, many organizations. She was an active member of Braille, helping them and um, doing things for the Braille people. And um, she had a scooter and a picture of her later where she used to go through the neighborhoods and all the neighbors knew her uh, as the, she was driving by always. 
She loved La Cabana and getting margaritas was a family. Many occasions we were there. And also she loved her pets. Like I said, she's rescued from many shelters. Next. This is her, a picture I found of her as a young girl uh, teaching a student. So she already was helping people even at that early age. Next. This is a, one of the uh, certificates she got from where she donated to the, um, I think it's a boys club and Father Flanagan sent this and it's kind of hard to read, but basically it says, it's a lot uh, harder to teach a kid to hate than it is to teach him to love. You know, that sort of kind of caught my eye, you know, that, that was a good little thing. She probably really appreciated that. Next, <clears throat> this is her and her scooter, her infamous scooter. <laughs> And she would like go up to the door of the garage and lock the scooter and she had a cane and there was a table there and she would wrestle her way to the scooter, back it out of the garage, she had a clicker to close the door and then she would cruise all around the neighborhood and then come back. It was pretty amazing. She did that till she was 98 years old. <laughs> Next. And that's a mother with uh, Trin Lan. This is a good friend of hers. It's a family we've known ever since we moved to Sao Paulo. They're a Dutch family also. And um, we've always kept in pretty good touch. <clears throat> Next. There is a picture of us in La Cabana. My mom on the left, Brenda in the middle, <laughs> and me, and then uh, my grandson, J.D., giving us the victory sign. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <clears throat> now, even after she was uh, wheelchair ridden, she still wanted to go to events, but she couldn't go. So what she would do she would buy me a ticket and her a ticket and says, guess where we're going? <laughs> so here's where we were at Phantom of the Opera, uh, taking her to that. And then she introduced us like maybe 15 years ago to a, a Cavalia, which first was in Pasadena. It's like a circus act, but it's between acrobats and horses. And it's just amazing about what they do. And a few years back, they were in Camarillo, a big white tents just before you went up the grade to Thousand Oaks. Yeah. You could see the big white tents, and that's what they were at. And we took all the grandkids to see it. It was just an amazing, amazing thing. And if you, I got some flyers that I'll show when we're in um, eating in, our, in the lunchroom there, if you want to look at it. It was very impressive. But she's the one that introduced us. She found it, and she's the one that introduced us to that. Next. <clears throat> now, here's my mom and one of her best friends that she did a lot of traveling with. She did uh, cruise to Alaska with her. She went to South Africa with her. She went to cruise to Hawaii with her. And they both were real animal lovers, and that's her dog, Bo. That's probably one of her favorite dogs that she had for many, many years. <clears throat> Next. And she also had a great summer humor. She loved parties, okay, even in the beginning. Next. Here's her. <laughs> I found this where she's playing wheelbarrow. I thought that was, that was kind of interesting. <laughs> Next. And this is when my mom and my dad went to Holland after we immigrated to the United States. And... The guy behind it is my uncle. It's my dad's oldest sister's husband. And when those two got together, it, everything was crazy. They were just nuts. And here they're doing some kind of skit. I don't know what it is. My mom's at the bottom there. And then uh, my uncle and his wife and the three kids are there with my dad <laughs> doing some kind of skits. I don't know what it was, but it was, she enjoyed doing that kind of stuff. Next. Now there's a tennis group that she was with. <clears throat> with. It was probably some kind of Halloween event. And um, you can't hardly see her face, but you can always tell it's her because of the grass skirt. She had that for many years. <laughs> Next. And here she is uh, doing a Braille event. Now, they obviously couldn't see her for that, but uh, <laughs> she was still came dressed up. And in the Braille folder she had, there was many um, pamphlets with notes on it that basically chronologically described her life, just like I'm doing. So it looks like to me what she did is she did a lot of presentations for the Braille people to show her the, all the things that she did, which is probably was very interesting for him. Next. <laughs> this was at my 70s surprise birthday party up at the KOA meeting room up there in, in uh, Steckel Park. And they had a corner set aside where they had all these different icons you could use to do stuff. And so the grandma's here playing a rock band. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <clears throat> And of course, she was always very involved with our family. I mean, uh, and, and let me get this right. Shannon will talk about that. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, she was always ready to babysit whenever we needed, and uh, she was a good Indonesian cook, nasi goreng, bami goreng, lumpias, uh, croquetta. She always knew all of that stuff, so that was always a big uh, get-together thing that we loved to do. She was a great swimmer, and she loved to teach swimming to the kids and the grandkids. And she was always participating in our Christmas and uh, Thanksgiving party. When we used to do the ghost house, we'd just wheel her out there and with the jacket on, and she would just watch all the people go by through the ghost house. And of course, the caregivers became an integral part of her family. These people were just absolutely amazing. That allowed her to stay in her house that many years. Next. This is a picture of when we were new in Nikiri. My dad is Santa Claus and my mom is Swarta Pete. Now, in the Dutch, that's the way they do it. They have Santa Claus and a black helper. And December is, is celebrated on December 5th. And December 25th is just the celebration of, of Jesus Christ's birthday. And what they used to do is put uh, wooden shoes out with grass for the, for the horses for Santa. And I remember doing it. I think the kids remember, Mike, the kids remember doing it. Seditions we kind of kept alive. <laughs> and we weren't supposed to know that was them, but later on at the house, I know that they were struggling trying to get all that black stuff off of her face. And I remember that. <laughs> Next, <clears throat> that's my mom teaching Shannon how to, uh, how to swim in my neighbor's pool, <clears throat> her neighbor's pool. Okay, next. And this is a picture of her and me and Jessica and Inga, which is my brother's uh, daughter. And she was visiting us and we went to the Long Beach Aquarium and that's where that picture was taken. Next, this is uh, all of us in the spa. That's uh, JD and Ms. Oma, and me in the back, and the two Shannon's two girls there. <clears throat> Next. And that's a picture of Oma Yasmin. I really like that picture. It's cute. And then also with uh, Scarlett and the two grandmas when she graduated at Thousand Oaks High School. Next. And that's a picture of Oma and Jessica. And then a picture of Oma and the two boys, my grandsons. <clears throat> And that's Jake and Oma in our living room. And that's uh, Oma at, uh, I should say, Oma is grandmother for Dutch. So uh, just so you say Oma, <laughs> remember that that means grandmother in Dutch. And then Shannon, and she's at Shannon's wedding at, um, at Lake Casitas. We had that at Lake Casitas. So it was a very nice ceremony. And that's the whole family there. It's uh, Karen at the bottom, and then my mom, and then uh, Brenda's mom, Thelma, and then Nancy, Karen's partner, and then the two boys, the three girls, Kathy, her sister in the back, Shannon, her husband, and me, and then Robin and, and Brenda on the left, that's uh, second to last row. And then my brother who lives in Houston, he doesn't come over here too often, so we had a separate picture of him and his daughter. And this is Dennis. Uh, he, she, uh, uh, Mom met him at the community center when they, she had uh, lunch there a lot of times. And he would come over for, for years. He came over and played dominoes with her. And it, and it was very nice. He was a really nice guy. He kept Mom occupied at night so she wasn't bored. And um, we just have a lot to thank for what he did for her also. And this is the amazing caregivers. <laughs> I get choked up every time I have to think about those people. We have Alva, I can't even read it, really. Patty, Lauren, uh, Lupe, Elvia, Teresa, Darlene, Ashley, and uh, Michelle, which is Brenda's friends. These are all, for the last 12 or so years, these are all the people that helped take care of my mom. The ones in yellow are the ones in the picture where they're Lauren at the bottom, Elvia on the right front there, and then Darlene in the middle, and then Teresa. And like I said, it's because of these people that my mom could stay at that house till she was almost 98 years old. Next. Her last celebration of life was her 99th birthday at the assistant living facility. Next. And um, she really enjoyed this. After that, she started going downhill pretty quick, but at least we got her 99th birthday in there. And one day when I took her to the dining hall, she said, Jack, I guess I'm not gonna make 100. <laughs> so. Next, <clears throat> one thing she loved was chocolate. <laughs> so a lot of people always gave her chocolates for her, uh, for her birthday. Next, so here, I'm just saying that here that because of the sacrifices that my parents made, we were allowed to basically have the life we did. 
My sister basically, uh, she got a master's at Chico in psychology and was hired by Addison Wesley, which was a publishing company. And her job mainly was to uh, recruit new authors for books and to sell books to professors. And she did so well, she always got these huge bonuses. <laughs> she did very well. My brother in the middle, he started out as a deckhand on a Western Geophysical Seismic Research Ship. And they basically, the, the special ships with a mine-long cable behind it with these geodesic phones on them. And they had these high-powered air guns next to the boat that would set off depth charges. And then the sonic waves would buy them, bought them off the ocean and then this, the phones would record it. All this data was processed and recorded in computer uh, stuff on the, on the boat. By the end of his career, he was stationed in Norway and Norway built the hull for the boat and it was his job to outfit the whole boat with all the equipment in it. So that was quite a step up on the ladder of that company that he did. On me, I, I got a degree in mathematics and computer science at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and uh, most of my career worked for the <clears throat> military, uh, developing weapon system software for the F-14, F-18, and the standoff jammers, the A-6B and the A-18G. And one of the interesting stories I can tell with that is that uh, one of the more challenging jobs at this was develop a new gun site for the F-14 called multi-mode gun site. And we had some innovative changes in there. And it took about four years to perfect it. And at the end of four years, this major Valentino from Top Gun called me because he wanted, they're basically in charge of developing a ACM air combat maneuvering tactics uh, during for dogfighting. And um, so I sat with him on a number of meetings explaining all the new capabilities of the gun site so he could develop tactics for it. And um, I asked him if he would host our Cub Scout crew because Brenda at the time was, was in charge of the Cub Scout group. I didn't really expect him to say yes, but he did. So what we did is we all, I had no problems getting chaperone on that trip. <laughs> we all went down to a Motel 6 by San Diego and um, basically we got a bunch of rooms and the night before we all watched the movie Top Gun in one room just to get in the right frame of mind. And then um, the next day we met Major Valentino at, at the base. He brought us in there into the ready room. It's just like in the movie where you can see this room but about 30 seats. And they have all these stick airplanes on the wall, plastic airplanes, mock-ups of MiGs and every other fighter, with a stick on them so they could demonstrate to the students to do dogfighting. And um, so after that, the kids got to try on some flight suits. We got introduced to a real Maverick uh, pilot. And we also got uh, uh, individual trips up to an F-16 in the cockpit through a ladder he rolled up. And the, the instructors use F-16s so they're smaller and more maneuverable than F-14, so that made the, uh, the, the students have to work harder to keep up. <laughs> but all these careers and the wonderful people we met there is all basically due to these wonderful people there, especially my mom, who was with us for 99 years. <laughs> so thank you, Mom. We are forever in debt to you. Next. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Shannon. She's going to talk a little bit about what Oma meant to her and her family. Next, please. I have notes, because <laughs> I tend to be a little more emotional and lose my train of thought easier. <laughs> okay. I cherish many beautiful memories with my Oma, spanning my entire life, from early childhood to the final months of her extraordinary journey. Sorry. During my toddler years, I recall delightful moments spent at my Oma's house. Accompanied by my Opa before he passed away, we would often visit the neighbor's pool like you saw in the picture and I was showered with endless affectionate hugs from my Oma. My Oma's deep love for her Dutch heritage was very infectious. She passionately shared that with me. She took great joy in teaching me numerous Dutch nursery songs, which by the way, my husband recently made me sing to strangers when we took a trip to Europe. <laughs> he first prompted me to sing the Sinterklaas Kapuncha, but it was a Dutch couple and I guess Dutch people are stubborn. <laughs> and he said, you can't sing that, it's not Christmas. <laughs> so 
so then I sang the Tue Amatis Vat the Hall, and, and it was really nice because the lady who was Dutch also knew the words, and we sang it together. Um, so I was very proud that I knew all the words to that. I also have such fond memories of sleepovers at my Oma's house where she would read me nursery rhymes before bed. I remember wink and blink and nod, which was a favorite of ours, and I could still picture that nursery book on the bedside table. Our playdates in her backyard, oh my gosh, I loved her backyard. It was like stepping into a magical realm in my mind, like Narnia. She always had fun activities planned, arts and crafts sessions in her kitchen. She taught me how to play tennis. She taught me how to swim. We would embark on exciting adventures, visiting her friends' houses, such as Joanne Souter and Han Mostenbrook. Whether it was playing bridge or a beach day, each outing was filled with joy and excitement, turning ordinary moments into unforgettable experiences. Next. My, uh, this is my husband. Oh, sorry, I think you skipped one. Can we go back? Yeah, it's a picture of Hot Rod. Can we go back to one? Well, it's okay. No, I could, no. okay. I don't want to take away his moment. <laughs> 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 my, uh, my husband also had a very deep admiration for Oma. In the last year, he broke her out of the hospital and we were fortunate enough to spend some precious moments with Oma in the comfort of her own home in Santa Paula that she adored. Together, my husband and Oma would venture outside, tending to the plants while talking about life. Next. Oma was, um, in addition to being an extraordinary Oma to both me and my brother, she continued to extend her love when we started our own families. She embraced her role as a great grandmother to Jessica J.D., Yasmin, Scarlett, William. Her cycle of love continued as she passed on her knowledge and experiences to the next generation. She took great delight in teaching our children many things, how to swim, guiding their first strokes in the water. I can still hear the sound of tennis balls hitting against her garage with laughter and enthusiasm as she shared her passion for the sport of tennis. Again, arts and crafts became a cherished tradition at her dining room table that the kids talk about. The clattering of the wooden blocks on her kitchen floor as she encouraged our children to build and explore. And together they would engage in friendly competition of the marble game, Moncala, I think is how you pronounce it. And it goes to, it also goes to, without saying that not only, sorry, and not only the great she did, she love all of her great grandkids, but she also um, had amazing culinary skills. She was an extraordinary cook, showcasing her love through the delicious Dutch and Indonesian dishes she, she prepared. From the delicious flanges in the morning that we all craved and loved, and I, William could eat like 20 to 30 of those <laughs> in, in, a, in a setting, to her mouth-watering nasi goreng for dinner. She passed down these cherished recipes to my mom, and in turn to me, and I hope to continue the tradition by sharing these dishes with my daughters, knowing that I'll never quite match my Oma. Next. Next. Yeah. And I think we may have missed a slide about my brother, so I'm just gonna quickly just talk about um, my, my brother, he's not here, but my Oma was also a source of love and inspiration for my brother, Jake. While it's true that he mostly inherited his dancing skills and rhythm from my mom, mm -hmm. I got my dad's, unfortunately. <laughs> I firmly believe that our Oma's enthusiasm for music and dancing also had a significant influence on him. She always took great pleasure in hearing about the latest shenanigans my brother was up to, whether it was soccer, or Boy Scouts, or FFA. She was always 100% invested and supportive. My Oma put Dr. Doolittle to shame, as you've heard over and over again. Any stray animal in the neighborhood seemed to instinctively know that they could find treats and a feast at her back doorstep. <laughs> she had an immense love for all animals, big and small. 
one memory that stands out in my mind was when my, my daughter Jessica dressed up as Dorothy for Halloween when she was younger. And she was participating in the Santa Paula Halloween Parade. And I asked Oma if Jessica could walk her loyal dog, Bo, in the parade, who looked exactly like Toto. And Oma's face lit up with excitement, and she was more than happy for, for Bo to be a part of that. It was a proud moment for her to see Bo and Jessica, Toto and Dorothy, strolling down Main Street, eliciting smiles and applause from the crowd. And just like this picture illustrates, every dog in our family knew the best lap to jump in was Oma's. <laughs> <laughs> so just to kind of, in closing, during our last visit with Oma, my husband and I went to um, her assisted living facility and um, we were giving her hugs and I was kind of off to the side and Oma looked up to Hot Rod and asked him what we thought was a playful question. She said, so you can drive, right? And he, with a grin, he responded, yes. <laughs> and then Oma seized the moment and she said, okay then, why don't you push me to the car and we'll go. Mm -hmm. He didn't really quite know how to respond to that and he just looked at me and I really didn't know what to say either. I just had a smile on. And so he just chuckled and he said nothing. Seconds passed, but my Oma was resolute. <laughs> she fixed her gaze on him and with unwavering determination, she demanded to know, well, is that a yes or a no? <laughs> <laughs> she had found, a, they were partners in crime, so she knew if there was a way to get back to her home, Hot Rod was the one to do it for her. <laughs> so just in that instant, um, we again saw the fire that burned within Oma's spirit. Her adventurous soul and her thirst for life and independence never wavered. And I miss her and I love her very much. Thank you. I was, uh, I'm Karen, I'm Tinica's daughter, and I was supposed to be, um, a preface, and now I'm a conclusion. <laughs> um, I wanted to do some thank yous. Um, I went <laughs> about uh, 40 years ago, we had a service for my father here, as my brother mentioned, um, and today we're honoring my mother. Um, but I wanted to, to thank the Presbyterian Church and the pastor, Bob Ramos, and also um, Chris Buchanan, and they've all helped us so much put this event together. Um, I would also like to do a big shout out to Jack, um, because he, being mom's eldest son, being the firstborn, living nearby, being power of attorney, <laughs> and caring for all her needs for years uh, was a big responsibility, which he carried out with compassion and a giant heart. So we, we really thank him a lot. Now, mom is a short but powerful word. And if you invert the letters, it becomes wow. And there was a lot of wow in her spirit, and her spirit lives on. Um, and the other thank you I wanted was to thank you all for coming to help us honor her spirit. And I have a couple, letter, a couple of lines in a poem uh, from Anne Lindgren Davidson, I'm Free. And it says, if my parting has left a void, then fill it with remembered joy. A friendship shared, a laugh, a kiss, ah yes. These things we too will miss. So in the, in the uh, spirit of remember joy, I was wondering if we could take just a moment to close your eyes and bring up a memory, if appropriate. <laughs> well, no, no, not, I mean if, if you had a connection to mom. Um, and just take a couple deep breaths with closed eyes and try to connect with that moment and bring her closer into the present. I know she's here, I know she's watching, I know she's smiling, she loved attention. <laughs> 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 
and then when you've kind of touched the connection and come back, um, and I also wanted to mention that at the end of the service, we're playing a song by Tina Turner, um, and it's titled, Something Beautiful Remains. Now, Mom died May 6th, and Tina Turner died May 24th. So the, the refrain in the song is, tears will leave no stains, time will ease the pain. For every life that fades, something beautiful remains. So that will be repeated in the song. And that's all, oh, and then I was supposed to tell you about the slideshow. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my family, when there's, there was a Dutch family moving in the area, we always wanted to go there and meet them and uh, introduce ourselves. So we met the uh, Dejamar family around the 60s, because I remember Henry uh, took us to the train station. He drove one of the cars. And uh, so my mother, she spoke very broken English. She couldn't uh, speak very good English, so uh, she, w she was a very good friend of Tinica because Tinica spoke Dutch and uh, she really enjoyed her company. And Tinica was my mother's, and <laughs> I'm reading my story. Anyway, they would love to go to Ventura and go to the mall and have um, pie and coffee and a chat. And she came over a lot to our house. And then uh, at one time, Tinica got a new dog called Bo. And she called my mother and she said, well, I, I want to come over and visit with you. And then my mom told her, don't bring that dog. <laughs> <laughs> don't bring the dog. And I told my mom, you can't say that. That's, that's Tinica's baby. You cannot say that. So she called her back and she said, okay, you can bring your dog. And um, and so, but my mother learned to love that dog, and uh, she really, uh, she bought uh, the dog toys and a water thing so he could drink when he came over. And then we go over to the house, Tinica's house, and uh, a bow was something else, because as soon as we got in the house, Bo started running as fast as he could. He ran from the living room to the dining room to the kitchen. He ran as fast as he could. He was so excited we were, we were there, you know? Mm -hmm. He really loved it. And I just want to say that Tinica was a very popular and everybody loved her. Everybody that got in, in you know, was in contact with her or, you know, and she belonged to several clubs, the tennis club, the card club, and all kinds of club. And Tinica had, had lots of friends and she was always going places and doing things. And for me, I felt that she was like an aunt to me. I would visit her and tell her everything that's going on and she would listen and sometimes she would give me advice, you know. And my brother and I visited her uh, Christmas 2021 and that, that, that was just a year ago, when you think about it. And she was very upbeat and uh, as always, and she was in good spirits, even though she couldn't walk that well. And, um, and she was happy to see us, that we came by. I did see Tinica uh, when it was her birthday day, but uh, we left early because of the rain. But at that time, she still was very upbeat. She was in say, oh, I, I have to live here. Uh, no, that was not her, she was upbeat. And she was talking to us, asking questions, knowing where we were. And so uh, she didn't like it when we left. And um, let's see, where did I? And then, um, and Tinica, she lived to be a, a 99, basically healthy and <clears throat> mentally fit, uh, fit. So that's a big thing, you know what I mean? She, she was of good mind till she was 99. And, I don't know if I'll make it to be 99. 
And I wanted to give a special thanks to Jack Deshamar for taking such good care of his mother. Um, even when he worked, you know, he worked long hours at work. He would go there on Sundays and he would have, it was like an ongoing thing, breakfast with his mom. And he went over there and he would ask him, mommy, do you need anything? Or is there anything you can do? He'd fix stuff. And, you know, Jack, you were the, boy, if every mother had a son like you, they'd be really lucky. <laughs> I mean, he's. There were some <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure that you didn't always want to go there and you wanted to sleep in, but yet you said, you know, mom needs me and I'm going to be there for her. So that's great. And I wanted to read um, one poem to you guys. It's it, okay. Remember me with sunshine, laughter, joy, and song. No tears, please, for I am with Jesus now where I belong. As you remember me in the coming days, remember that I loved you all in a very special way. And she would spend like an hour talking to my mom, and I'd be reading a book or somewhere else in the house, and my mom would come over and says, Paula, come over. We, we want you to come over and join the conversation. I go, oh, you sure? And she goes, yes. So I said, whatever I was doing, I'd maybe just got back from work, or, and she said, come on. So I'd sit there. They'd already been talking for an hour, but just, so I'd sit there, and we'd talk another hour. And this was, you know, if I was in the house, I got called to do that. I mean, I mean mom would just wanted somebody else to bring up some other subject so she could extend the visit, right? But she would come over once a week at least, maybe sometimes twice. And my mother, every time she came in, she was thrilled. My mother just loved Mrs. Dushamar. Our whole family loved her. To, to say that it was like an aunt would be an understatement. She was everything to us, her mother. Wow. <laughs> As I was watching the slideshow and hearing your testimonies, um, I thought, I really live a boring life. Um, I would like to share a couple things. Two promises that Jesus made um, that I think are applicable for this time together and as we move forward in the loss of Tinica, but also the memories we keep. In the Gospel of John, in the 11th chapter, two promises come out about that Jesus promises. In chapter 11, verse 35, it says that Jesus wept. Shortest passage in the whole Bible. Jesus wept. Why did he weep? Jesus wept because he saw some of his closest, clo probably his closest friends other than the disciples, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And Lazarus had passed. And Jesus comes to them in their grief. And as Jesus listens to their hearts and he sees the tears and all the things that they were experiencing in the loss of their brother Lazarus, Jesus connects and he grieves. He weeps. One of the promises of Jesus is that when we are going through a time like this, as close family who spent all those years, again, I'm boring wife, man, but she was awesome, adventurous, loving, caring, kind. But she also, 
as Jack shared, she was a part of this community of faith, this church, for several years, a deacon. She loved Jesus. And you know, Jesus says to you and I, not only do I love Tinica, I love you. And I'm here today to meet you as you grieve her loss. Grief is an interesting thing. We may grieve today as we remember, as we remember Tinica's life, but there will be other times where you grieve Tinica's loss. Although her memories are really deep in your heart, Jesus wants to say when you, you hear a song and you think of Tinica and you grieve, or you read a poem like some of the poems that we heard today, and it triggers a memory, and you feel lost. Even at 99 years old, which I will probably never make, but even at 99, we still will have memories of Tunica's life and how they touched each of us individually. What a promise. The God of the universe and Jesus Christ really, truly loves you and cares about you and grieves with you. The other thing Jesus said in verse 25, he said to folks that I am the resurrection and the life, that whoever believes in me, I will give them eternal life. Tinica is in glory today. Whatever pain she may have had at the end, it sounds like she was hopping and doing everything in the world right up until that time, but all the pain, any of that has passed. And she is with her Savior, Jesus. Jesus made a promise that if each of us believe in him, if we put our trust and our faith in him, we're going to a family reunion with Tinica. What an awesome day. I'll finally get to meet her, which I regret not having the opportunity. But we can know that she is waiting for you for a huge family reunion that doesn't even compare with what we saw, even though they were awesome family reunions. Jesus makes two promises to us. And if you want to read John 11, it might help you. Jesus promises us that he's in it with us as we grieve and there's sorrow. But he also promises, come on, come to the family reunion that I have for you. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we give you praise this morning. Thank you for a full, wonderful life that Tinica lived. Thank you for all the people, both family and friends, and folks that we would never guess how she touched each of those lives in a very special way. Thank you for her life that makes an impact in our lives. And Lord, we, we extend your blessing upon Tinica's family as they grieve this time and continue to have memories and we pray that you would bless them, touch them, help them with all the decisions that need to be made, but help them especially as they walk through this period of time. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Before we go to Tina Turner, which I'm really excited about, actually. 
Um, before we go to Tina Turner, I want to extend an invitation of the family that we will have a gathering um, outside on the patio and um, afterwards the service, after Tina sings, we will depart and the way you get to the patio, please don't go out this door. There's a big step and we don't want any other folks getting injured. But go back to the back and go out the door to the left and then come right back and the, the patio will be filled. It's gonna be a wonderful time. Continue to share your memories with each other and encourage one another at the end of this time. I'm gonna pray a blessing um, on the food and then Tina will sing. Jesus, thank you for all your good gifts. And we pray your blessing upon the food today as we share Tinica's life with each other and we share in a meal. We pray your blessing on all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tears will leave no stain. Time will ease the pain. For every life that fades, something beautiful remains. We are living in a world of stars and dust between heaven. Beautiful remains. 
This officially concludes our memorial service for Nick Tanika. Go and bless, be blessed by God, enjoy the food, and be sure to go out that back door as you leave the sanctuary. All right, God bless you. Tears will leave no stain.